So, for those of you who don't know, my name is uh, David Caleb, and I'm the youngest of Peter and Diana's three children. And I want to start by thanking you all for being here. Uh, my family and I are so pleased and so touched by the number of people who want to be here today. I know uh, some of you flew in or drove great distances. Others delayed their holidays or changed their plans at the last minute. I hear the Blakes arrived in a camper with bikes on the roof, ready to head up island with their grandchildren, but unwilling to miss the chance to celebrate the life of such a special man. I know there were others who dearly wanted to be here but just couldn't, and I want to thank them for their kind words. My dad touched the lives of so many people over the years, and I really appreciate you coming today to celebrate his life and remember him. After dad died, mom produced a note that dad had written to me 16 years ago to be opened upon his death. There were some helpful pieces of information in the note and a few instructions, including one that said, no eulogy, <laughs> in capital letters, and underlined. So I looked up the word eulogy and discovered it comes from the Latin word eulogium and from the Greek word eulogia, meaning praise and speak well of. In some ways, this isn't a surprise that dad didn't want a eulogy, as he was always someone who didn't want to promote himself. So instead of giving a eulogy, I will abide by his wishes and just say a few kind words about my father. <laughs> the last few years have been a bit difficult. It wasn't easy to see dad struggling with Alzheimer's and to know that the thoughts and words that used to come so easily to him were moving just beyond his reach. But today is about the man he was, the man we knew, and dad was many things. He loved his family, was community-minded, believed in traditions, was extremely loyal, was renowned for his hospitality and wit, and yes, he could be a little bit stubborn. Dad was a master storyteller. There are stories from my childhood that he told so often that I can recite them by heart, although perhaps not quite as well as he did. These stories have become part of my life. I can tell you the story of how Kathy, Chris, and I tried to make bread in the kitchen in Canada when I was two years old and ended up making a glue-like mess. Dad always told the story so well that I can picture the scene in my head even though I don't have any recollection or memory of it. That was Dad. He was a storyteller. I understand that many of you may know where he came from and some of his history, but when I looked up on the internet how to give a eulogy, sorry, kind words, all the sites told me I should definitely share some of the facts of Dad's life. As it says in the leaflets that you're holding, Peter was born and raised in the valleys of South Wales in the little village of Bryn Mawr. His father, Harold Caleb, had been disowned by his wealthy Scottish family for some youthful misadventures and for marrying a Spanish girl, Emiliana Fernandez. And with the help of my father and his younger brothers, Harold and Amelia ran a village grocery with a small store and stall in the market. Amelia also made beautiful flower arrangements for weddings and funerals. Throughout his life, flowers always made my dad think fondly of her. Occasional visits to his stern Scottish grandparents were endured, but the boys spent many happy hours in the home of their Spanish grandparents. Dad's Spanish grandfather was called Nada. He was a warm, loving man who doted on his grandchildren. It was no surprise to us that Dad chose to be called Nada when he became a grandfather. And I know that these memories helped shape his wonderful relationships with his own grandchildren. As a young man, Dad left Wales to take law at University College London and Gray's Inn. His years in London resulted in some lifelong friendships and some very funny stories. If only I could tell them as well as he could. There was the one about him escorting his mother and the Queen Mother to a reception, losing both of them over the course of the evening, only to discover them chatting like old friends behind a potted plant. Even the boat trip to Canada in 1960 to take a teaching position in Victoria made a wonderful story. During the voyage, the crew went on strike, and it was up to the passengers to step in and perform their duties. Dad took charge of the dining room for which he was paid, which meant he could start his new life in Canada with a few extra dollars in his pocket. Although there were some wonderful stories from those early years in Canada, I couldn't possibly do them justice. So my father's dear friend, Nick Prowse, has agreed to share some of his memories of Dad a little later at the reception. And I'd like to encourage anyone else who'd like to, do, who'd like to share their stories and memories to do that at the same time.
Those years were also full of remarkable accomplishments for my father. As a young master at university school, he played a key role in building and fundraising for the school chapel. He left university school and began teaching at St. Michael's in 1964, becoming the school's headmaster in 1969, when headmaster Curl Simmons retired. After just two, after just two years, when St. Michael's School and University School be, were merged, he became the first headmaster of St. Michael's University School. It was while he was teaching at University School that he was invited home for Sunday dinner by one of his students, Terry Nelson, and met Terry's sister, Diana. In June of 1965, 49 years ago, they were married and the two of them began a new adventure together, beginning with a rather unusual honeymoon around Europe, accompanied by eight boys from the school. <laughs> now we get to the exciting part, kids. Mom and Dad adopted Kathy in March of 1972. I know this because there are photo albums full of pictures of Kathy. <laughs> Kathy with Dad, Kathy with Mom, Kathy on her own, Kathy with the dog Toby, Kathy on the floor, Kathy in the chair, Kathy eating. <laughs> And these weren't the only photos. Last summer I found boxes of slides that Dad had captured. It is very possible that I got my love for photography from my father. Growing up there was always a camera around and looking at these old slides I was impressed with his ability to capture the important moments of his life. Chris arrived in November of 1973 and there's also, there also a great deal of photographic evidence to support that fact. By now, Dad had moved forward with the technology of the day and was taking fewer slides and capturing more Polaroid photos. By the time I was born in January of 1975, Dad's photography boom was pretty much over. <laughs> Luckily, there are a few photos of my childhood, but I uh, have my suspicions that I was just being included of, with, of photos with Kathy and Chris. <laughs> Admittedly, the lack of photos might have something to do with the fact that Mom and Dad now had three children under the age of three in the house. To this day, I don't know how they did it. What is obvious from those early photos is how much both Dad and Mom loved the new additions to the house. They documented all the excitement, the fun, the milestones. The adventures of kids entering the Caleb house had begun. That was Dad. Family was the most important thing to him. In 1978, the family left Canada so Peter could set up the International Baccalaureate, or the IB program, for the American School in Switzerland. And in 1979, Dad became the IB coordinator for Southeast Asia, based out of the International School Manila in the Philippines. We lived in Manila for two years before Dad was offered a job as headmaster at Brent School in Baguio. He brought the IB program into the school and turned it into a flourishing international institution. When I traveled around Asia 25 years later, there was more than one occasion that someone would hear my last name and have known my father. They would tell me stories about what a pivotal person Dad was in bringing the IB to that part of the world. While headmaster of Brent, Dad worked to build a community within the school, whether it was the evenings where the entire staff came to his house to play Trivial Pursuit, or the way he treated everyone equally and like family, the many former students and teachers that have been in contact with us since his death have shown me that he managed to do exactly that. That was Dad. He built communities. The family moved back to, back to Canada in 1990, and in 1992, Dad and Mom built the bed and breakfast Winnicott Country House. I feel that the words that Dad put in the, on the plaque above the door of the B&B reveal so much about his character. They say, there are, no there are no strangers here, only friends we haven't met. This is truly how Dad lived his life. There were no strangers in our lives. Everyone was... Everyone was met with open arms and treated as part of the family. I remember Dad sitting around the table with a guest sharing words of wisdom like, I don't drink water, fish pee in it. <laughs> and the notes that the B&B guest book, in the B&B guest book, often said how welcoming Dad was and how the favorite part of their stay was the breakfast conversations with my father. That was Dad. He was known for his hospitality and for sharing his point of view. In my second year of university, I met a new friend named Jason Juto, uh, who was also in the edu education department, and he lived close by. I told him to give me a call if he wanted a ride to school. So one afternoon, the phone rang, and as he always did, Dad answered in his British accent, Caleb residence, Winterpot. The first thing Jason thought was, 
holy crap, this Dave guy's got a butler. <laughs> And instead of casually asking, uh, can I talk to Dave? He felt like he had to be a bit more formal and said, hello, is David there, please? That was dad. Even though he was a Canadian, you couldn't get the British out of him. One of the traditions dad loved most was Christmas. And he firmly believed that no one should be alone at Christmas. I remember some years when we had to use plywood sheets on card tables to extend the dinner table so that everyone he invited could fit around. Another of our traditions was Sunday night dinner. Family was expected to come and everyone was welcome. Countless times we would have to quickly add another place or two at the table because there was someone else coming for dinner. And as my grandparents grew older, my dad wanted to make sure that they could always attend, so he drove out to Machosen and picked them up. That was dad. He loved traditions. That being said, there were some traditions that my father wouldn't follow. When he was head boy in Wales, about 15 years old, he was told that if the younger students misbehave, he was to use the cane to discipline them. He refused. He would not hit another person. He felt it wasn't right. Not only did the other head boys start following in his footsteps, but the teachers in the school also stopped caning, and it was eradicated from the school altogether. That was my dad. He stood up for what he believed in. Now, nobody is perfect. My dad was imperfect and had his own struggles, but he was perfect for us. And although he was very principled and stood up for what he believed in, this sometimes came across as stubborn. Some of you may have seen this side of him. I know I did. Leading up to my wedding, Dad wasn't happy that we were having a ceremony in the garden at Wintercott. He wanted to be in the church and asked me, what about God? I replied, don't worry, she will be there. <laughs> but what I came to learn over time was that this stubbornness, stubbornness not only came from him standing up for what he believed in, but also from love. He didn't do it to be difficult. Well, maybe sometimes he did. <laughs> but that all being said and done, Dad would eventually accept what had happened and share with me his incredible pride. That was Dad. He was principled and could be stubborn, but he was also full of pride. One of the things that Dad really excelled at was being a grandfather to his four grandchildren, Anna, Alex, Grace, and Ava. I will always remember that whenever my children, whenever my kids were leaving the house, he would quietly slip a coin into their hand, just like his nada had done to him. He could always be counted on to read them a story, and it didn't matter if it was a stellar piece of literature or not, Dad would always try to make the story come alive. I have many memories of the four grandchildren sitting around nada as he injected his expression into books like One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. <laughs> That was Dad. He was a wonderful grandfather, and he was a wonderful nada. Dad brought the roots of his little Welsh village wherever he went. His life was a series of villages. What is life like in a village? You form close relationships with the people that you see on a regular basis. Any business Dad visited and liked became part of his village. He preferred to shop at smaller places run by local people so that he could contribute to the local community. That might be the local barber or butcher. And as one does in the village, he shopped daily for his groceries. Everyone knew Peter at the co-op and our co-op number by heart, 3447, because he could be seen there at least once a day. Dad created villages everywhere he went. When he took trips of schoolboys to Europe in the 1960s, he would always co go back to the same places, the same shops, the same restaurants. One year, when our family visited Sorrento in Italy, and Dad took us to a shop he hadn't been to in 20 years. The owner recognized him at once and shouted, Professore, with open arms. That was Dad. He was loyal. So that brings me back to the stories and storytelling and how, ever since Dad died, stories have been pouring in from all over the world. They have made us laugh and they have made us cry. Some are old favorites and some we're hearing for the first time. They have been a gift to us, and we would love you to continue to share them in any way you'd like, whether it's an email or a little later today at the reception. Although saying goodbye today is very difficult for us, I know that the examples he set for his children and grandchildren will live on through us. A very big part of who I am as a person is because of my father. I know we will all miss my father. And I want to thank you all again for coming today. 
to celebrate his life and remember him. Thank you.